We left off at Luke 11. Pretty good spot. Verse 37. We read, Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. And when the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially, ceremonially excuse me, washed before the meal. Now, <clears throat> this washing they're talking about, it has nothing to do with hygiene. Okay? This is what... Uh, it, it's a ceremonial tradition in Judaism, by the way. It was back then, and it still is today. All right? After you wash your hands to eat, you need to ceremonially wash your hands. All right? That's, uh, like I said, it's, it's a tradition in Judaism, and a lot of Messianic groups do it, too. I've, uh, I've been told by many people that, yeah, Messianic groups, quite a few of them do this. And... Um, we went through it when we went over Matthew. We went over the details of how this is. But what it does is that it allegedly cleanses one's hands from any spiritual defilement. Like if you had touched a Gentile or something to that effect. And uh, like I said, it's very prevalent still today. Um, and this is, this is how it's done. You take, the, you take the water and you pour it over your... In your right hand, pour it over your left hand three times, and then vice versa, and uh, you do the same thing type of thing with the towel. It's, it's not scriptural. Uh, you can buy your own chrome hand-washing cup just for this. Okay? Um, and it's, I mean, they sell them, and that's just what it's for. It's, this piece of Judaica is perfect item for the ritual washing of the hands, as you can see here. <coughs> And the Pharisees are telling Yeshua, now why, why, why didn't you do this? Luke 11, verses 39 and 40, And the master said to him, Now, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you're full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? <clears throat> now, the, the Pharisaic tradition also consists of ceremonially washing the dishes and other things, okay, in a very similar fashion. Yeshua is telling the Pharisees that they honor their worthless traditions, but they ignore the Torah of the Father. And that's, the, the Torah is built upon the love for him and one another, and that's what they're ignoring. But they're doing all these meaningless things that are not in the Torah, like these ritual hand washings and the ritual washings of the cup and the platter. Uh, but like I said, it's Torah that's built upon love for him and love for one another. In Jeremiah 4, verse 14, we read, Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem, that you may be saved. How long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? That's what needs to be washed, is our hearts. Proverbs 30, verse 12, There is a kind who is pure in his own eyes, yet he is, or yet is not washed from his filthiness. Verses 39 through 41. But the master said to him, Now you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. I wanted to read that whole passage together so we can get the, the gist of what he's saying here. He's saying you guys are clean on the outside. You look good. Okay, you wear nice robes. They, they wear the, the box on the head thing with the... Scripture in it, uh, they, they had the nice long zeet seats. They look good, but it said inside, that's a problem. Okay, he said inside, you're full of robbery and wickedness. <clears throat> they should be giving to those in need instead of looking to, to, to take from them. Okay, that's commanded in Torah, to give to those in need. In Deuteronomy 15, starting at verse 7, If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers... In any of your towns in your land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother. But you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Beware lest there is a base thought in your heart saying the seventh year, the year of remission is near, and your eye is hostile toward your brother, and you give him nothing that he may cry to Yahweh against you and it will be a sin against you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. 
because for this thing, Yahweh, your Elohim, will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. <coughs> for the poor will never cease to be in the land. Why is that? Why didn't he just make sure that the, the poor were all provided for so we wouldn't have to worry about this? We have the opportunity to show the love of the Father. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's for, it's for an opportunity for us to show the love of the Father. <clears throat> Therefore I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. And when you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as Yahweh your Elohim has blessed you, and you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh your Elohim redeemed you. Therefore I command you this today. Also in Psalm 41, the first three verses, How blessed is he who considers the helpless. Yahweh will deliver him in a day of trouble. Yahweh will protect him and keep him alive. And he shall be called blessed upon the earth. And do not give him over to the desire of his enemies. Yahweh will sustain him upon his sickbed in his illness. You do restore him to health. Psalm 112, verse 9. He has given freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. His horn being his power. Proverbs 14, verse 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker. But he who is gracious to the needy honors him. Proverbs 19, verse 17. He who is gracious to a poor man lends to Yahweh. And he will repay him for his good deed. And one more. Isaiah 58, which Isaiah 58 is all about Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, okay? And its purpose, okay? It's to break the bonds, and this is what it's talking about. Verse 7, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth. And your righteousness will go before you. The glory of Yahweh will be your rear guard. Then you will call and Yahweh will answer. You'll cry and he'll say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And Yahweh will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. You'll be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. <coughs> that's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that's, that's the opportunity we have is to help one another. Uh, if you haven't been here very long, you'll notice we don't ever pass a plate. We don't beg for money. Uh, if anyone wants to put money in the Zadaka box, it's by the refrigerator. It's uh, Zadaka's charity. And what it does is just pay the bills. And also, the rest of the money goes into a helping hand fund for people among us that need help. So <clears throat> that's what we do. Nobody, nobody gets a salary. Nobody, you know, it's, we're, not, we're not church. Okay. <clears throat> Luke 11, verse 42, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay the tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of Elohim. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Yeshua said they should still be honoring all of Elohim's Torah and not just these commands that empower them. And that's what they were concerned with, these commands that empower them. They were disregarding justice and the love of Elohim. That wasn't important to them. Verses 43 and 44. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the front seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. Well, the, the Pharisees, they love the attention and they love the importance that's placed upon themselves. Okay, then the people give it to them. They give all that importance and attention to them. 
They love their power and their egocentric lives. But Yeshua said they're like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware. Now, the reason he says that is that to touch a body or to walk on a tomb makes a man unclean for seven days. In Numbers 19, verse 16, also anyone who in the open field touches one who has been slain with a sword or who has died naturally or a human bone or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. Now, it doesn't mean it's a sin, but it makes you unclean. <clears throat> and what was happening here, he's saying that you're like a, you're like a grave that's, that's unmarked and buried, and no one can see it, and people are just standing on it. They're getting unclean and not even knowing it. They say, your teachings and examples are making the people unknowingly filthy and unclean. They're, you're making them filthy and unclean, and they don't know it. Verses 45 and 46. And one of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, when, when you say this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Now, a lawyer in that day, that was a teacher of the, of the Torah, okay? It wasn't necessarily lawyers like we think today. But they were burdening the people with traditional laws that the lawyers themselves ignored. In Isaiah 10, verses 1 and 2, Woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights in order that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. See, they were putting on an oppressive yoke on the people. That's what they were doing. But Yeshua said his burden of Torah is easy and light. That's in Matthew 11, starting at verse 28. Yeshua says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle, or gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, excuse me, and my load is light. Now, notice he does say there's a, there's a yoke there, and there is, uh, there is a load to carry. But he says it's easy and light. But how do we know what that is? So he didn't specifically say there, but actually he did. See this capitalized part here? What does that mean again? It's a quote from the Tanakh. And it happens to come from Jeremiah 6, verse 16, where we read, Thus says Yahweh, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. That's the Torah. Where the good way is, and walk in it. And there you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. That's where the quote comes from. You shall find rest for your souls. That's his burden. That's his yoke. It's the ancient paths. It's easy and it's light. Verses 47 and 48. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. Consequently, you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. <clears throat> they honored the prophets of old with, uh, with monuments and tombs, but it was their fathers who didn't listen, and it's their fathers who killed them. But you see, they feel righteous now because they build... They build statues and tombs in their honor. In 2 Chronicles 36, verses 15 and 16, And Yahweh, the Elohim of their father, sent word to them again and again by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of Elohim, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of Yahweh arose against his people, until there was no remedy. Uh, Elohim goes, you know, we, we, you may watch the news, get frustrated. Things are terrible in so many ways, and, and they really are. <clears throat> but Elohim will reach his point, okay? He'll reach his point to where he'll say, well, there's no remedy. So we're going to, uh, we're going to change things. That's what he'll do. Verses 49 and 50. 
For this reason also the wisdom of Elohim said, I will send to them prophets and apostles. Some of them they'll kill and some they will persecute. In order that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. <clears throat> the blood of all the prophets whom their fathers persecuted and killed is going to go against those Pharisees because they falsely use the prophets' messages for their own power and their own gain. Okay? Uh, by definition, what's a prophet? Ones who speak the words of the Father. Right. Um, if, you speak of, if you speak of his Torah and tell others correctly, you are prophesying. Okay? What's an apostle? A messenger, a missionary, really. That's one who leaves his abode and goes out. Okay? Those are the ones, by the way, it's spoken of in uh, different parts of Scripture that need, sometimes need help, need supporting. All right? Because they're leaving what they're doing and trying to go somewhere. As for those that uh, want to study and teach the Torah with others, and they're staying home, they can get a job. That's what they're supposed to do. Okay. Yeah. Elohim puts on hearts and minds of those he wants. So, I mean, a lot of these, uh, should we say, uh, not prophets, but these uh, people that go out to pre preach the word or whatever they want to call themselves, mission, missionaries or something. Right. Um, they're out in left field, right? Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, if you preach into the board fence, then... Well, you see, but we don't know who, who is and who isn't. In other words, you let them know where it is in case they... Yeah, we don't know who is and who isn't, so that's important. <clears throat> no, that's fine. That's fine. That's that's good question. Verse 51. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perish between the altar and the house of Elohim. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Um, a lot of people have said, uh, don't know exactly who Zechariah, which one they're talking about, if that was one who was killed recently, and therefore he's saying all the prophets from Abel until now. But uh, Zechariah, he was murdered. It's, it's recorded in Second Chronicles. Um, and, and that's the last book, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible, is Second Chronicles. And it gives the history of the nation. It's in 2 Chronicles 24, starting at verse 20. Then the spirit of Elohim came on Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus Elohim has said, Why do you transgress the commandments of Yahweh and do not prosper? Because you've forsaken Yahweh, he has also forsaken you. So they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him to death in the court of the house of Yahweh. Then Joash the king did not remember the kindness which his father Jehoiada had shown him, but he murdered his son. And as he died, he said, May Yahweh see and avenge. <clears throat> that seems to be the obvious person he's referring to because uh, he said he perished between the altar and the house of Elohim, which is what that says here. Verse 52 of Luke 11. Woe to you lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. Uh, they were to be teaching the word of the Father, his Torah, but they were distorting it to the people. His Torah and the fear of Yahweh, is that's the key to knowledge. All right, His Torah and fear of him, that's the key to knowledge, period. Malachi 2, verses 7 and 8 says, For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Yahweh of hosts. Now what if he's teaching wrong? But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You've caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Yahweh of hosts. Proverbs 1, verse 7 says, The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 15, verse 33, The fear of Yahweh is the instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7, Trust in Yahweh with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. Now, uh, 
in previous life, Christianity, I'd read, trust in Yahweh with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding. What would that mean to you? We kind of, hmm? Believe. Believe. Yeah, believe. Yeah, believe in Jesus. Yeah, that's what it'd mean. And Jesus will guide my heart, right? The Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and guide your heart, right? No. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, speaking in tongues, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what, uh, what does it mean, trust with all your heart to lean on your own understanding? It means just read his Torah and follow that. That's all. It's real simple. I mean, how many years did you go by as a Christian saying, I don't really know what he wants me to do, but if only it was written down in black and white, you know, if only he'd done that, wouldn't that be great? You know, if he had actual instructions that he gave us, if we only had instructions in life. But no, all we have is to follow your heart with Jesus in it. Yeah. Yeah, a bad thought. People think a bad thought is a sin. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, really, there's only one thought in Scripture that is, uh, it's, it's a thin. That's a thin. That's sin. It's called coveting. That's it. That's the only sin that is a thought. Hmm? It is a doozy. But, you know, it's from, it's, it's from your heart of coveting the things like stealing, murder, adultery, all those things come from the sin of coveting. That's what we have to understand. <clears throat> and he's provided so well for us. Psalm 103, verse 17, For the loving kindness of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Luke 11, verses 53 and 54. And when he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him on, in something he might say. The Pharisees and the lawyers were evil in thought, word, and works. Okay? They were plotting against Yeshua. They wanted to kill him. They couldn't trip him up in front of the people. They couldn't dishonor him in front of the people. They tried and tried and tried, but they couldn't do it. They ended up getting it knocked back right in their faces. Well, they're plotting against Yeshua and wanting to kill him. This was prophesied, by the way. Psalms 56, verses 5 and 6, All day long they distort my words. All their thoughts are against, uh, are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. So, any, uh, any questions on Luke 11? Like I said, that was about the last third of it, at least as far as our study goes. We will uh, take a break for about five minutes, and we're going to cover Luke chapter 12. Let's look at Luke chapter 12, and I, I put the title of this, Settle your case now, and we're not even going to get to that till the end of the chapter, but it's very important. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 12. Verse 1 says, Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of the multitude had gathered together, that they were stepping on one another. He began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, there were thousands of people crammed together to hear the words of Messiah. What's the message? Why are there so many people there? The message is the kingdom's here. The kingdom's here, and he's proved it. He's, uh, he's made the lame walk. He's made the blind see and the, the deaf to hear. <clears throat> and he tells them here, with all the crowd there, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, leaven, in a symbolic fashion, always represents evil in Scripture. Just symbolically, there's personally nothing wrong with yeast, all right? But if it's used in a symbolic fashion, it's representing evil. 
in Scripture. <clears throat> um, the Greek word for hypocrisy, it's, it's hypocrisis. Hypocrisis. And what it means is play acting. They're wearing a mask and they're play acting. That's what he, say, what he says they're doing. <clears throat> Right, and, and you don't, they're playing, they're playing a part is all they're doing, okay? They're play acting, and it's, it's, it's spreading throughout Israel, much like yeast spreads in a dough, all right? And that's what the problem is. And then when you hide that yeast in the, in the dough, what happens to the whole loaf? It gets leavened, okay? And it's ruined. I mean, actually, it's good bread, but it's not good. That's not good for the people. Verses 2 and 3. But there's nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in the inner room shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Now, there are probably everyone in this room that's saying, I think I need to work on that. Okay? Me too. Okay? Me too. Everything we say and do is going to be revealed. You know, and, and I say it and I need to do it myself. We need to live our lives as if we are being videotaped every second. All right? That's how we need to live. There's nothing that will be hidden from the Father. Look at Ecclesiastes, the last passage in Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear Elohim and keep his commandments. Because this applies to every Jewish person. Didn't say that, did it? This applies to every person. Okay. For Elohim will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Luke 12, verses 4 and 5. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that, I have no more that they can do. But I'll warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after his, uh, he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Yeshua says, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body, but be afraid of the one that can exterminate you permanently, is what he's saying. The Greek word for hell here, it's Gehenna. And Gehenna is a valley west and south of Jerusalem, and it was usually kept burning because it was kept as a trash dump. And uh, here it's used to represent the lake of fire at the final judgment. Fearing Elohim, who can cause eternal death above all else, is a common theme in the Tanakh, by the way. In Isaiah 51, starting at verse 7, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my Torah. Do not fear the reproach of man, neither be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. Awake as in the, arm, the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep? who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over. So the ransomed of Yahweh will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. And everlasting joy will be on their heads. They'll obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, and the son of man who is made like grass? That you have forgotten Yahweh, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor, as he makes ready to destroy. But where is the fury of the oppressor? In Proverbs 14, verses 26 and 27, In the fear of Yahweh there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. The fear of Yahweh is a fountain of life, that one may avoid the snares of death. Jeremiah 5, starting in verse 22, do not fear me, declares Yahweh. Do you not tremble in my presence? For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. 
But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They've turned aside and departed. They do not say in their heart, Let us now fear Yahweh our Elohim, who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have withheld good from you. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, the fear of Yahweh, very real, real thing. Okay? Very real thing. He created everything. And he causes things to happen. He's in control. Complete control. And he's righteous. Proverbs 2, first five verses. My son, if you'll receive my sayings and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of Yahweh and discover the knowledge of Elohim. Let's go back to Luke 12, verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? And yet not one of them is forgotten before Elohim. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you, are more, you have uh, of more value than many sparrows. See, from man we have nothing to fear. He, can do, he can't do anything outside of the will of the, of the Father, and the Father greatly values his people. When Yeshua says the hairs of your head are numbered, he's using a reference uh, similar to instances in the Tanakh. Uh, in 1 Samuel 14, 45, But the people said to Saul, Must Jonathan die, who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Far from it. As Yahweh lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with Elohim this day. So the people rescued Jonathan. He did not die. Then in 2 Samuel 14, verse 11, then she says, Please let the king remember Yahweh your Elohim, so that the avenger of blood may not continue to destroy, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As Yahweh lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. And I point these things out to show you that Yeshua didn't say anything new. Okay? He didn't say anything new. It's all in the Tanakh. He just put it together and showed the people the truth. Luke 12, verses 8 and 9. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man shall confess him also before the angels of Elohim. But he who denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of Elohim. <clears throat> You know, Christians think this passage means that we are to say, Jesus is Lord, and then we're saved. Okay? That's not true. The Greek word for confesses is the, uh, the Greek word homologio, which means to speak the same, to agree. Okay? Okay. Um, it means that if we are in one mind with Yeshua before men, Yeshua will be of one mind with us before the angels of Elohim. The Greek word for deny means to contradict. <clears throat> Yeshua says of those men who contradict him, he will contradict them before the angels of Elohim. So... You see, we are to be of the same mind of, of, as Messiah. Remember uh, Yeshua saying, whatever you pray in my name, you will get it. Okay, you'll receive. What he means is, whatever you pray in my character of the same mind of you and I, you'll get it. All right? That's what he means. He doesn't mean say magic words at the end of a prayer. If you'll notice, I never say in Yeshua's name, Okay, I never say that. Uh, you could, but uh, that's not the intent. I always, as your humble servants, okay, that's to me. We need to be, more, we need to be humble, and we need to be as servants. Yeah? You just swipe in a credit card. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, I don't know. Anyway. Cliff, you need to stop Christian bashing. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Uh, some of it out of ignorance, yeah. Luke 12, verse 10, And everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven them him. Okay. <clears throat> Now, don't anybody put on your Trinitarian hat when you're looking at this, okay? Because it's silly, and you look silly wearing it. So, <clears throat> first of all, the word spirit, what's it mean? Breath. breath. It means breath. Breath of the Father. <clears throat> Ruach, that's right. Um, Elohim spoke the world into existence, all right? Now... Try and speak without breathing. Doesn't work, does it? <clears throat> He's talking about his, his breath here. Uh, it's, the word is pneuma. It means a current of air, breath. That's, that's its definition. So um, the, the holy, the set-apart breath is from who? The Father. It's the Father's. The breath of the Father is where Yeshua receives his power, not from any other entity. All right? It's from the Father. Matthew 3, verse 11. It says, as for me, this is John the Baptist speaking here, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he was coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He'll baptize you with the breath of the Father and fire. <clears throat> Look at Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Yeshua was led up by the breath of the Father into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Matthew 12, 18. Behold my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my breath upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. John 6, verse 63. It is the breath who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are breath and are life. What's the difference between breath and life? Really nothing, just one's a different way of saying the other. Isn't it? <clears throat> now, the reason this even came up right here, where he says, uh, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. The reason it came up is because of last chapter, by the way. <clears throat> the Pharisees accused Yeshua of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub instead of the power of the Father. Beelzebub meaning a reference to Satan. That was in Luke 11, verses 14 through 16. And he was casting out a demon, and it was dumb. And it came about that when the demon had gone out, the dumb man spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. All right, <clears throat> let's review real quick what we just talked about. Yeshua receives his power from the Father, the breath of the Father, right? They say, the Pharisees were saying, he receives his power from Satan. <clears throat> what were they calling the Father? They knew he didn't get his power from, the, uh, from Satan. They were just telling the people that. That's blasphemy against the Father. Okay? And then he said, well, you won't be forgiven for that. You know why? You know why there's no forgiveness for that? Take a look at the ten words. Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your Elohim in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Be very, very caref careful with his name. Okay? And references to him. Be very careful. We need two witnesses to that, though, for, it to, for the matter to be established. Oh, there it is. Deuteronomy 5, verse 11. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your Elohim in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. 
What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Using, uh, making references to the Father that are bad. Okay? Making references to the Father that are bad. And not honoring his name. Is that clear? Nothing new under the sun. Okay. Uh, you, I've, how, many, how many sermons have you heard about what they thought blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was? How many sermons? 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 40 in the back. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, me too. But it's sure, sure a lot simpler than what they said it was, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. I would say that would cover uh, you know that phrase that a lot of people use quite often. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But that has, that's not his name. As, as long as okay, good, I made the mistake of saying that a few times in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to Luke twelve, verses eleven and twelve. Any reference to the Father, just be careful. Okay? Make it a thoughtful... I, personally, I don't use his name unless I'm reading it and it's in Scripture. Here, I, I just soon leave it that way. That's just me, but... <clears throat> Let's look at verses 11 and 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not become anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. That's the same thing that Elohim told Moses, by the way. Exodus 4, verses 10 through 12. Then Moses said to Yahweh, Please, Master, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in the past, nor, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, what did he mean by that? He doesn't, like so many people say, stuttered. That's not what it is. He was supposed to go speak to the elders of Israel, okay? That's who he was supposed to go speak to. Uh, his first 40 years, who raised him? The Egyptians. The next 40 years, where did he spend it? Midian. Okay? Now, here's an 80-year-old man. How much Hebrew has he been around? Poco. <laughs> like my Espanol. <laughs> what he's saying here is, you want me to go speak to the elders of Israel? I, I don't know the language that well. You know? Uh, I know Shalom and, and Shabbat. There. <clears throat> I can go up to him and say Shabbat Shalom, but <laughs> that's what he means, all right? I don't know the language that I need to speak to them in. And Yahweh said to him, who's made man's mouth? Or who makes him de uh, dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? It's not, is it not I, Yahweh? Now then go, and I, even I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. Well, he kept arguing, and then he finally said, yeah, Aaron's on his way here, okay? He's been speaking it all his life. Uh, if you're going to just argue with me about it. So, anyway. <laughs> Verses 13 and 14. And someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter over you? Uh, this man thought Yeshua should be judge or arbiter for his little family squabble. He says, uh, No. No. You and your brother... Put the box of gloves on, handle it. Okay? Uh, not interested. Verse 15. And he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Warning against greed. The love of money. Now, money's, money's good. Don't get me wrong. I like to pay my bills too. Okay? I even like a little left over after I pay the bills. That'd be nice. Yeah, like what? Yeah, helping people too. I like to have that left over to help people with. But the love of money, you see, now that's a problem. Psalm 62, verse 10, do not trust in oppression. Do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Uh, it's, uh, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it's gone. 
For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Well, that's been my experience. Verses 16 through 18, and he told them a parable saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store all my crops? And he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I'll store all my grain and my goods. You know, uh, this man solely relies on his wealth for, for his life and his happiness. Okay? That's everything to him is his wealth. Verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But Elohim said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward Elohim. See, when he says soul, once again, don't think ghost. That's another one that means life. Okay? That means life. This very night, your life is required of you. So much for your happiness. <clears throat> the man who lays up treasures for himself is putting his security in his wealth and turning away from Elohim. Hosea 10, verses uh, 1 and 2, Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. Their fruit is faithless. Now they must bear their, bear their guilt. Yahweh will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. Habakkuk or Habakkuk 2, verse 9. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high to be delivered from the hand of calamity. <clears throat> you know, uh, it says, uh, Scripture says you can't worship... Elohim and mammon, which meaning money. Now, probably the biggest evidence of that, which one you serve, is what you do on the seventh day of the week. Do you realize that if you follow Torah, you're losing at least one-seventh of the possible income you could be making? You know that? That's what you're doing. Some things are worth more than money. A lot of things are worth more than money. That Sabbath day is worth a lot more than money. Yeah, you're exactly right, Michael. But that's how the world looks at it. What's going to be the busiest day at Walmart in the mall tomorrow? <laughs> or, uh, this week. It'll be tomorrow, won't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure will. It sure will. <clears throat> that's a good gauge as to which one you worship right there. I didn't read that yet, did I? No, I don't think I did. Luke 12, verses 22 and 23, And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life, as to what you shall eat, nor for your body, as to what you shall put on. For life is more than food, and the body than clothing. We're not to be anxious or worried about the things in this life. He already knows you need them. Okay. Our food and clothing would be provided by the Father. <clears throat> It seems like the more we have, the more we desire, doesn't it? When this happens, possessions turn out being our very life. Verse 24, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, and they have no storeroom nor barn, yet Elohim feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? So, you know, Yeshua points that out, that these ravens, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store up their stuff in barns. Yet Elohim sees that they're fed. This is a paraphrase of, one, once again, what's said in the Tanakh. Job 38, verse 41. Who prepares for the raven its nourishment? When it's young, cry to Elohim and wander about without food. Luke 12, verses 25 and 26. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why are you anxious about other matters? If we can't add, when have you ever said, I wish I'd worried about that some more. If only I'd worried more, okay? It would have turned out so much better if I'd worried more. 
my mom always was a worrier. Mom, quit worrying. I can't help it. You may as well tell me to quit breathing. <laughs> no, Mom. Breathe? Don't worry. <clears throat> so it's, I don't know. Some people feel like they have to worry. Don't worry. Worrying is a waste of time. It's another principle clearly taught in the Tanakh. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden upon Yahweh and he'll sustain you. He'll never allow the righteous to be shaken. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. When I'm afraid, I'll put my trust in you. In Elohim, whose word I praise, in Elohim, I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Isaiah 50, verse 10. Who is among you that fears Yahweh, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and rely on his Elohim. <clears throat> Verses 27 and 28. Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if Elohim so arrays the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O men of little faithfulness? You've got to keep in mind, Solomon almost, he essentially cornered the world's market of gold. He had it all. But he still couldn't dress himself as beautiful as a single lily in the field. Once again, Yeshua has given a short discourse on a passage in the Tanakh that combines the flowers in the field, grass, and the life of man to make a brilliant point. Look at Isaiah 40, starting at verse 5. And the glory of Yahweh will be revealed. And all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what should I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of Yahweh blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Elohim stands forever. <clears throat> By the way, just a little hidden thing there if you want to, uh, just a little revelation interpreter. You, you have given a little clue there. When it talks about grass, symbolically, what's that a reference to? People. Keep that in mind. Pull it out of your pocket one day. Verses 29 and 30. Do not seek what you shall eat and what you shall drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. These are the things that the nations of the world seek and live for. Elohim will provide for his people. Verse 31, but seek for his kingdom, and these things shall be added to you. You know, uh, what goes with that, the kingdom thing? What's the first word in that gospel again? Repent. That's correct. Turn to his Torah and seek the kingdom. In Matthew's version of it, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. That's Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Turn toward his righteousness. Yep. That's it. Now his kingdom and his righteousness are synonymous in many ways. Because only those who seek his righteousness, his Torah, are going to enter that kingdom. In Revelation 21, starting at verse 23... The city has no need of the sun or of, or of the moon to shine upon it. For the glory of Elohim has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, go back to Luke. Luke 12, starting at verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves purses which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
He's speaking of the kingdom. Yeshua is. He says, uh, do not be afraid. What kind of flock? What does he say? Little. Little flock. Not a big flock. That's not, that's not billions. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> you know, keep in mind, he only came for one group of people only. All right? Just one group of people. That's what he said. Matthew 15, 24, but he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's all. So if you're one of his, you're a part of that house of Israel. <clears throat> Yeshua um, said for the people to provide for the poor among them, for this displays their heart. He said that same thing to the rich young uh, ruler, and that's in Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 18. And a certain ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, okay, why does he ask this question? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Why does he ask that question? Because he's rich and he everything. Yeah, but what did he hear that inspired him to ask that? Um, yeah, but where does the resurrection occur? At the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? That's why he asked it, because they've been talking about it. He knew that meant eternal life. All right? And Yeshua said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except Elohim alone. And he's, he's uh, implying his deity here. And he said to him, you know the commandments... Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Uh, what about the kingdom now? Repent. Turn to the Torah, which is what he says. And the guy says, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Yeshua heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. You remember Deuteronomy 15? We just read it. 7 through 15, there's going to be poor among you. Now, Yeshua is here. He's not only teaching them. Okay? What's he also had to do more than once? He had to feed them. Why? Why didn't they bring their own lunch? They're poor. They're poor. They didn't have anything to eat. Okay? There were three classes in that day. You had the rich, the poor, and the dirt poor. Okay? No, no food, nothing to eat. No place to live. Okay? How many of those people do you think were following Yeshua around? A bunch. And here's, here's this... This man, how do you think he was dressed? Rich, young ruler. What a description. Do you think he had to read his bio to figure out that's what he was? No. No. By what he was wearing. But look at your thousands of, remember, just said thousands of him are, are around him, stepping on each other. Why? They want to eat. They want to get rid of, they want to get healed from their broken bones and their pains and their organ failures and, and, their, and their disease. And this guy's here. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, well, okay. Uh, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness on your father and mother. Rich guy like that. Where do you think he gets his money? Mommy and daddy. The term young comes to mind here. And mommy and daddy probably got it from other people's land. You know, everyone in Israel is supposed to own land, right? It's been given to them, right? Where'd it go? The rich scarfed it up. You can get these things, you know, for nickels on the dollar if you get it at the right time. You know? And if you don't worry about that year jubilee thing, then you keep it. Right? Well, you've got to maximize a man's profits, right? So he's saying, what must I do here to inherit this Eternal life you guys have been talking about in this kingdom. Well, these things, well, I honor my mom and dad. Oh, yeah, they're, they're great folks. They gave me everything. I really don't need to steal. Uh, I don't see anything here I could steal. There's nothing here you people have that I want. Uh, I don't murder. I don't kill anybody. Don't need to. Um, don't commit adultery. No, okay, won't do it. Uh, i got six wives anyway, so what the heck. <clears throat> All these things I've kept from my youth. He said, one thing you still lack. It's that Deuteronomy 15 thing. You know all these people that are all around here that they can't eat and they're so sick and I'm trying, I'm helping them. 
Sell what you got and feed them. Distribute it to them. And you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. He had the opportunity to be disciple number 13. Okay? He had an opportunity. And when it says he uh, didn't have it in him because he is very wealthy. Verse 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps alight. What's that mean, keep your lamps alight? First of all, be dressed in readiness. What's that mean? Righteousness. Right. Have you heard the term? In Scripture it says, don't be caught naked. You know what that means? Without your righteousness. I think the modern term, don't be caught with your pants down. Okay? Scripture means... Always be righteous. Keep your lamps al alight. That means follow the, his Torah. Psalm 119, verses 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Proverbs 6, 25. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Verse 36 of Luke 12. And be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately upon the door to, uh, open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table, and he will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are these slaves. Well, this is similar to the ten virgins at the, uh, at the wedding feast. We talked about that the other day. This is very, very similar. Yeshua says we are to be obeying his Torah at all times and in all places because he's coming at an hour you're not quite going to expect it. Verses 39 and 40. And be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Well, he says he's coming. It's going to be like a thief in the night. You never know when that's going to happen. Therefore, always be prepared. Verse 41, And Peter said, Master, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the master said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. Yeshua appears to be addressing this to his disciples or his stewards who are in charge of his, uh, of his servants. He's speaking of those who teach his word to his people. That's what he's talking about. Verse 45, but if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time coming in or incoming and begins to beat the slaves both men and women, to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign, assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will shall receive many lashes. Well, to beat slaves among uh, Israelite slaves is forbidden. They are to be treated as hired hands. Now, there comes, there comes a time uh, when people had to sell themselves as slaves, okay, to feed my family. So it would be for a certain period of time they do this, not allowed to beat them. Leviticus 25, starting at verse 35. Now, in the case of a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Do not take usurious interest from him, but revere your Elohim that your countrymen may live with you. You shall not give him your silver at interest, nor your food for gain. I am Yahweh your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your Elohim. And if a countryman of yours becomes so poor with regard to you that he sells himself to you, you shall not subject him to a slave service. He shall be with you as a hired man, as if he were a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. He shall then go out from you, he and his sons with him, and shall go back to his family, that he may return 
to the property of his forefathers. For men to be beaten for their unrighteousness, though, is uh, in Torah. Deuteronomy 25, the first three verses, if there's a dispute between men and they go to court, and the judges decide their case, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall then make him lie down and be beaten in, presence, in his presence with a number of stripes according to his guilt. He may beat him forty times, but no more lest you beat him with many more stripes than these, and your brother be degraded in your eyes. <clears throat> uh, it sounds harsh, but sometimes it's what it gets down to. Okay. Luke 12, verse 48. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. And from everyone who has been given, much shall be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. <clears throat> that's why Yeshua said the Pharisees will receive the greater punishment. Those who know his Torah are obligated to keep it and are entrusted with a lot. Do you remember the parable of uh, the servants who were given five talents and two talents and one talent and they did well with it so they were given more? Well, that's still more responsibility too. See, and that, and that gold that is talking about, the talents of gold that they were given, that's the word of the Father. Verses 49 and 50. I've come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. See, uh, I remember uh, when we had Church of Christ night here, the invasion of the Church of Christ people. It was a fun night. But they, they insisted to me that baptism is literal. Baptism is literal. When it says baptism, it means literal. And I asked them, okay, do you baptize with fire? It says, it says doesn't it? Yeah. Well, he's already been baptized. What's he talking about? See, the term baptism, I've told you, if you have a, a good Greek lexicon, there's going to be 22 different definitions of the term. The Greek word baptizo. So you can't just say it means this. You have to apply it. What's, what's it? And by the way, every time baptizo is there, they automatically just throw baptism in there, even though it could mean something else in our minds. Okay? <clears throat> um, he's, what he's speaking about is his impending death. His impending death. It's something he's going to have to undergo. In Mark 10, starting at verse 36, he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant that we, we may sit in your glory, one on your right, the other, and one on your left. But Yeshua said to them, You do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He's talking about this ordeal he's going to go through. That's what he's talking about. Yeshua is referring to his upcoming death as a cleansing Baptism simply means a washing or a cleansing. The act does. John baptized with water, but Yeshua baptizes or cleanses with the Spirit of the Father. In Mark 1, verses 6 through 8, And John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. I still like that verse. I like it. I mean, here, you could see him coming out of the wilderness, and you could almost smell him. You know? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. By the way, there's deep meaning in that, and we'll go over it one day. Not tonight, though. He says, I baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Yeshua came and cleansed us from our sins, which occurs when His Spirit dwells within us, then we're cleansed. Okay? What does water symbolize in Scripture again? The Spirit of the Father, the breath of the Father. That's why, that's why baptism is done. Baptism is the outward sign of the new covenant. And what happens with the new covenant? That's when his spirit dwells within us. Hebrews 9, verses 14 and 15. 
How much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? And for this reason, he's a mediator of a new covenant. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the, inter of the eternal inheritance. Look at Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 25. Then I'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. See, this is why baptism is a symbol. It's a cleansing. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh. Your stubbornness, by the way. And give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my breath within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. That's the cleansing that takes place. Now, in this passage in Luke, Yeshua is speaking about baptizing with fire and the Spirit of the Father. He says uh, in Luke 12, verses 49 to 50, I've come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Also in Luke 3.16, John answered and said to them, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not unfit to untie the thong of his sandals, who baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with the breath of the Father, and fire. To baptize with the Spirit means to have the, Spirit, the breath of the Father poured out upon us. Proverbs 1, verse 23, turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my breath on you. And what happens then? I'll make my words known to you. Okay? Yeshua said, I came to give what? Life. Well, life. And give it more <laughs> abundantly, right? What's the difference between life and breath? Ah, just a reference point, I believe. It's the only difference is a reference. Reference point, your point of view on it. <clears throat> he came to give the breath of the Father and give it abundantly. That's why he came. Isaiah 35, starting at verse 15, until the spirit, the breath, is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field. And the work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. Then my people will live in a peaceful habitation and in secure dwellings and in undisturbed resting places. And it will hail when the forest comes down and the city will be utterly laid low. How blessed you'll be, you who sow beside all waters, who let out freely the ox and the donkey. Isaiah 44, verses 3 through 5, For I'll pour out water on the thirsty land. What's water represent again? The breath, the spirit of the Father. And streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit, pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And they'll spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am Yahweh's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, belonging to Yahweh, and will name Israel's name with honor. You see, it's even prophesied we wouldn't know what to call ourselves. See? I was jesting, but to baptize with fire is to cleanse us at his return, by the way. That's what's going to happen. It's going to cleanse us with his return. In Isaiah 4, starting at verse 2, In that day the branch of Yahweh will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. And it'll come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When Adonai has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem by her midst, by the, by the breath of judgment and by the breath of burning. Zechariah 13, verse 9, and I'll bring the third part through the fire. Refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold, and they will say, Yahweh is my Elohim. 
Malachi 3, verses 2 and 3, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he'll sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. And he'll purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to Yahweh offerings in righteousness. See, I, I hear Christians all the time, oh, I want Jesus to come back now. No. <laughs> I, don't know you know, I don't know that you know what you're asking for. <laughs> oh, yeah, do they want a drink of that cup? That's a good question. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be a, the great, and it's, it says the great and terrible day. Okay, of Yahweh. That's what it's called. It's not going to be easy. That's why Christians invented that rapture nonsense. Escape. To escape that, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I always wondered, which came first? The idea of the rapture or Star Trek? <laughs> I, I was thinking Star Trek, yeah. And Scotty. Luke 12, verse 51, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They'll be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. That's the truth. I've seen more division with Torah obedient people. Uh, with those with family members that I've seen in ev any other single thing <clears throat> it's it's crazy uh, I don't see that much division in Christian families over their beliefs I, I just don't see it the greatest division is caused when someone in that family follows the Torah then he's a pariah then no one wants to go near him or her uh, they seem to be as scripture says chosen Two from a family and one from a city. Jeremiah three fourteen. Return, O faithless sons, declares Yahweh, for I'm a master to you, and I'll take you one from a city and two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. Did they leave the word billions out of that? I don't think they did either. I don't think they did either. Luke 12, verse 54. He was also saying to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower's coming, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it'll be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? If they were wise, they could understand this. Deuteronomy 32, verses 28 and 29, For they are a nation lacking in counsel, and there's no understanding in them. Would that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would discern their future. Luke 12, verses 58 and 59. For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him, in order that he may not drag you before the judge, and the judge turn you over to the constable, and the constable throw you into prison. I say to you, you shall not get out of there until you've paid every last cent. This is a paraphrase from Proverbs 25, verses 8 and 9. Do not go out hastily to argue your case. Otherwise, what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor. Do not reveal the secret of another. Now, Yeshua here is saying, settle your case. Okay? Settle your case. I made that the title of tonight. Settle your case. Settle your case with Elohim. Okay? Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait till you're standing in front of him in judgment to try and settle your case. Don't do that. Too late. Then all the, the only thing that's going to happen is, is the gavel's coming down. Do you think you have a good case right now? I don't. I don't have a good case. Okay, I got a pretty crummy case. I can't afford the lawyer that's going to take, get me off. It ain't going to happen. Start settling your case now. Start now being obedient to the Father. Okay? Do it now. 
deal with him now. Start obeying his instructions. Start honoring his name and his appointed times. Start now loving your neighbor and caring for those who aren't able. Start making your case. That's what Yeshua is saying. Any questions on Luke chapter 12? What's that? You're responsible. Yep. Especially in this day and age, more so than ever. It's what? Well, I didn't have the information. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that excuse will get you, get you off on it. I didn't get enough information. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh-huh. My people perish for lack of knowledge. There's, we don't have that excuse. We don't have it. Anybody else? Let's, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, your, your word is, is so great and powerful. And may Yahweh bless us and keep us. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Thank you for joining the Bay Yeshua Network.